You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't know this, this title was going to turn into a little mini-series, but I've enjoyed this, and I hope you have too, but I should wrap this up tonight. But we've been talking about, do you know him? Do you really know him? You know, first of the year, we always make some New Year's resolutions. Don't raise your hand. How many already broke your New Year's resolution? <laughs> it don't take long to break a resolution. Now, you know, I'm not for a resolution, not against it, but I do, I am for making adjustments. Amen. We should all make adjustments, continually be making adjustments. No matter how spiritual you get, you still need to make some adjustments. But anyway, we're going to dive into this and keep talking about do you really know him? Do you know God? You know, don't know about him, but do you really know? There's many people that know about God, and they think they know God. And, of course, they're being deceived for that. But uh, I want to encourage our people here at Video Life Church to continually to get to know him. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And we're going to give you two couple foundational scriptures, and then we're going to get into some teaching. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, our key passage is, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Verse 14 says, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. People are being deceived today because they don't really know God. They don't really know who he is. And sadly to say, they think they're on the way to heaven, and they're really not. Amen. Because it says here in this passage I just read, at the end of the day, so to say, there's only two choices you got. It's going to be a narrow way or a broad way Amen. at the end time. It's only two choices. That's it. There's not going to be uh, another choice. It's going to be one or the other. So my job is to make sure that we teach the Word of God and have you ready, prepared, and on your way to glory. Amen? Amen. Next scripture, foundation of scripture, if you could put this on the amplified version, please, is Colossians 2, verses 6 through 8. And there's a lot going on in these passages of scripture, but I'm, I'm doing it in the amplified so you can probably, uh, or all of us can get a better feel for it. It says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, it didn't say you have heard about Jesus Christ the Lord. It says that you have received Jesus Christ the Lord. Walk in union with him. And how do you do that? Reflecting his character in the things you do and also in the things you say. Living lives that lead others from sin. Not mixing in with them, but leading lives that lead others away from sin, having been deeply rooted in him. Say, I'm deeply rooted. I'm deeply rooted. And now being continually, continually, that's the key word there, built up in him and becoming increasingly more established in your faith. Hallelujah. You notice the ladies are not with us tonight. Keep them in prayer. They're at home getting stronger in their faith. Amen. <laughs> And uh, we do miss them, and uh, I think we did all right without them tonight, but uh, <laughs> I think we did all right. Uh, actually, this is probably not the right time for it, but it just reminded me, if I don't, I might forget it. Tonight is the first night that we are, you're able to pay for your marriage seminar that's coming up. We got a marriage seminar coming. Everybody knows about that. We got a, had a sign-up sheet to see who was interested. We got enough people interested. Now you got to go pay for your books. Couples. One couple, one book per couple. You don't, each person, husband and wife don't need, what are you saying? Oh, there's two books. Okay, I tell you what, go by the Welcome Center. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of jumped the gun and said we were doing okay without the ladies, didn't I? Okay, I was told there's only one, one couple needs one book, but you go back there, and they'll take, straighten you out at the Welcome Center. You can either pay for lunch, or you can bring your own lunch. Hallelujah. Let me get back into the Word, what I was called to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Having been deeply rooted in Him, and now being continually built up in Him, and becoming increasingly more established in your faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing in it with gratitude, which means abounding in it with thanksgiving. 
Verse 8, this is a key, this is really key here, talking about deception here. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, like intellectual babble. You know, you got some good deceivers out there. You got, and if you listen, if you listen to a lie long enough, you'll believe it. You know that? So you got to be aware, like the word says, be aware, be conscious of what you listen to. See to it, no one takes you captive through intellectual babble, according to the traditions and musing of mere men, and following the elementary principles of the world. In other words, don't follow the teachings of the world, but rather, but follow the true teachings of Christ. We are led by Jesus Christ, and we are to follow his teaching. That means no compromising. And we see that a lot happening today with well-known religious organizations, Catholicism, Methodists. They're, 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 they're compromising what the Word of God says. But we, as born-again Christians, are being taught, especially here at Victory Life Church, what the Word truly says, and we stick with the Word. The Word's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But if you're, if you're generally a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness. You will walk, you will live in the way of righteousness. And if you step off the path, then we're going to get into some really deep teaching as far as sin and how sin is in our world today. None of us is without sin. We've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But when you do sin, you don't live... You, you live a lifestyle of righteousness. If you mess up, you know, th sin is sin. If you mess up, you immediately get back on the path of righteousness. I believe you should repent. A lot of people, even well-known ministers are teaching, if you're tr truly born again, you don't have to repent. Well, you know what? I'd rather repent and not have to repent <laughs> and don't repent and I should have repented. <laughs> are you with me? I believe in repentance. Repentance, is, it shows you, it, it's, it's more, see, God is going to look more at your heart. Okay, we're going to get into more of that. Amen? But we do, I believe we have to repent. If you have professed to have gone through the narrow gate, yet you live in the broad way like the world does, the Bible wants you to know that you should be afraid because you don't really know God. Got quiet on me in here. If you live like the broad way, you're not going through the narrow gate. That's the way, a simple way to put it. Amen. Now let's get to Hebrews chapter 10. And this, uh, I actually, I don't know if the battle is the right word, but I've always kind of wanted to get more revelation of this scripture. And of course, when I do that, I'll start dialing into other translations. And things. So I kind of did that. But anyway, let's go to Hebrews 10, verse 26 and 27. When you get there, say Amen. For if, if I say if, if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, if you just read that and not study it, you're going to say, well, man, if I sin after I know who Christ is, after I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, there's no sacrifice for my sins. But... That's not what it really means because I looked up the Greek terminology for sin willfully and this is what it means. This Greek term carries the idea of deliberate intention of sin that is habitual. That is habitual, which means the practice of sin, which means living a life of sin. This sin is rejecting Christ deliberately and intentionally Falling away, or one of the words it used, I think it was the Matthew Henry commentary. I don't know, what, I'm, I think it was, I'm not sure. It used the word defection. That tells, see, I, I've always, I don't believe that once saved, always saved. Because you can be born again and you can fall away or you can defect from being a Christian. And listen to what defection means. I love this definition of defection. We all know what it means, but when you read it, and I encourage you, when you study the word, even if you know what a word means, if it's a key word to that scripture, look it up in the dictionary because that will bring some insight to it. 
So anyway, that's what I did with the word defection. Defection is the desertion of one's country in favor of an opposing one. Are you understand where, I, where I'm getting at? So it, it's not if you sin willfully. It doesn't mean if you accidentally sin and you're born again Christian. It's talking about intentional, habitual, the practice of sin. Defecting, you're defecting from the kingdom. That's a good way to say it. Defecting from the kingdom. There no longer remains, once you do that, a sacrifice for sins. Y'all getting it? Now, can they defect back? I believe they can. If their heart comes back with true repentance. I don't believe because you defect that you can't ever come back. I don't believe that. I believe it's a heart issue. Are y'all with me tonight? So it says here, but a certain uh, fearful expectation. Let's look it up in the Amplify, please. Put that up in the Amplify. It says, uh, for if we go on willfully and deliberately or intentionally sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer then remains a sacrifice to atone for our sins. That is, no further offering to anticipate, but a kind of awful and terrifying expectation of divine judgment and the fury of fire and burning wrath which will consume the adversaries, those who put themselves in opposition or those who have defected away from God. Are y'all getting this tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. So I've come up with some checkpoints to, 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 to know that Jesus is working in your life. If you need to know that he is truly working in your life. Number one, are you growing in holiness? Am I growing in holiness? Means am I growing in the word? You know that you have been truly saved because you're in the process of being in your process of being changed. That's number two, being in process of being changed. That means you're maturing in Christ, you're becoming a better person, and you're becoming certainly a stronger Christian. Your lifestyle is one of walking in the path of God's word or the path of God's truth. That's your lifestyle. You're walking the way that God wants you to walk. Are you getting that? Hallelujah. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Go back. Why well, should I go back to Matthew chapter 7? And we're going to pick up here in verse, I got to put that up, 15 through 20. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. I'm a strong Christian and getting stronger. Hallelujah. I'm going to read this and then we're going to come back and break it down. Verse 15 says, beware this is Jesus' teaching, by the way. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Ravenous means eagerly, greedy, hungry wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear, bad, or does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you would know them by their fruits. Hallelujah. Now, let's go back and break that down. First thing Jesus said is what? Beware of false prophets. Jesus just warned us right there of a path that will lead us to destruction. He also reminds us that there are many who will try to guide us along the broad path that also leads to destruction. So what is he saying? The first, the first step into combating or battling against false prophets is to beware. Beware. Be conscious. Be alert is another word you could use. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then let's go to verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in, okay, just different thing, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. It is the nature of these false prophets to deceive and deny their own character. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. Oftentimes they even deceive their own selves. They even believe what they're saying. 
even though it's not true. You know, you can believe, you can get people to believe a lie. It happens all the time. Hallelujah. Oftentimes they even deceive their own selves, believing themselves to be sheep when in fact they are the ones that are ravenous wolves. People get messed up when they start entertaining lies. That's when people get confused. They get messed up when they start entertaining lies. Be careful what, or keep, be careful not only what, but be careful who you listen to. Make sure everything, there's a lot of teaching on, you know, we got access to a lot of ministers, a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching. Make sure it lines up with what the Word of God says. Doesn't matter how much money they have, doesn't matter how much money they make, no matter how big their congregation is. Make sure it lines up with what the Word of God is teaching. Amen? Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Why did Jesus say that? Because that is a way that we can guard ourselves against false prophets or false teachers or false people by, talk, by taking heed to their fruits. This means paying attention to several aspects of their lives. We should pay attention to their manner of living. Do they show or display righteousness? Do they show or display humility? Do they display faithfulness in the way they live? If they are ministers, pay close attention to the content of their teaching. Is it truly the fruit from God's Word? Or is it more man-centered, appealing to the ears that want to be tickled? Or appealing to the ears that they, that they want to hear? You know, let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 4, chapter 3, 4. Hallelujah. That's first Timothy. That's the second Timothy. Chapter four, verse three through four says this for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who is they? That is people, that's us. There'll come a time when we will not endure sound doctrine. But according they will endure according to their own desires. Because they have what? Itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Teachers that preach and teach what they want to hear so they can, uh, uh, they can have an excuse for their lifestyle. Basically, well, that's what it is. There's a lot of teachers that want to draw people in based on what they want to hear instead of based on what the Word of God says. And they will turn their ears away from the truth of God's Word and, turn, and be turned aside to fables, which is false teaching. Beware, people. Amen? Amen? Verse 17, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. The fruit is an inevitable result of who we are. Eventually, even though it may take a time for the harvest to come, the good or bad fruit is evident, revealing what sort of tree we are. So your fruit is going to is going to allow us or allow us to see what kind of tree you are. And it's not just on Sundays and Wednesdays. You don't just change trees. On <laughs> you can't be a a thorn or a bush or thorn. Or you can't be a thorn or thistle tree or thorn bush or thistle tree on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday you can be a, a good fruit, an apple tree. <laughs> you can't change fruits like that. Amen? But there are some wishy-washy people out there, so they may somehow figure out how to do that. But anyway, we don't want to do that. Hallelujah. But you will know them by their fruits. Let me just say this. A farmer will never go to the field and expect a thistle or a thorn bush to provide any fruit. We'll never do it. It is impossible for a thistle or thorn bush to produce fruit. Why is it impossible? Because it's against its nature. It's against the nature. Matter of fact, if a farmer goes to a field and he sees thorn bushes and, and thistles, he's probably going to cut them down and throw them into the fire. 
because it ain't going to produce nothing good. Y'all not getting that? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Verse 19, listen carefully what Jesus is saying. He didn't say every tree that only bears bad fruit. He said every tree that does not bear good fruit. So that he that brings forth no fruit, he that brings forth no fruit is just as guilty as he that brings forth bad fruit. Remember Jesus, he cursed a fig tree. It didn't produce nothing, and he, and he burned it up. Are you with me? So it's not just you got to bear, uh, that you're not bearing any bad fruit, but you got to bear good fruit. So don't just be comfortable not bearing any fruit at all. Hallelujah. Ask yourself, do I bear fruit unto God's glory? Hallelujah. Do I bear fruit unto God's glory? But you will know them by their fruits. What Jesus is saying is the fruit of your life is proof what is truly inside your heart. Love? Is love a fruit of the Spirit? Joy? Joy fruit of the Spirit? Is peace a fruit of the Spirit? Yeah. We like listening to that. No, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, kindness. I heard a story. Now, I don't, now, some, now when I tell you when I heard a story, it means I come across a story. Now, I don't fact check stories and stuff, but it kind of goes along with my message. So don't, you, don't I, I, I've never had somebody say, hey, that story, where'd you find it at? Is that true or not? Really, I don't know if it's true or not. Because I don't know what's true on Facebook. I mean, I don't do Facebook. I don't know what's true on Google or what's not true on Google. I guess Google has stuff that's not true, I assume. But anyway, I come across a story. I come across a story. I think it was on Google, but it's talking about kindness. There was a young teenage boy, and he was, uh, he was depressed. He didn't have any friends, um, and he had a... Uh, Make it a long story short, he had decided that he was going to go home and take his own life after school. He decided it was just, he just wasn't happy. He decided to just end his own life. Well, it so happened, a boy he never met happened to come up beside him while he was walking home from school. And this boy just got to talking to him. That's all he did. Just got to talking to him, carrying on the conversation. And then he went on back, he went on, I don't know how long, I don't really know how long it took him to get home, but when he got home, because of that conversation, he met that young boy, he decided not to take his own life. And the two boys became best friends growing up. Amen. So kindness is definitely a fruit of the Spirit. Amen. So let's do some, let's do some self-check tonight. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What about complaining? Is that a fruit of the Spirit? What about gossiping? Gossiping is not a fruit of the Spirit. Now, we, we're self-evaluating we're self ourselves tonight here. What about bitterness? Jealousy? How about criticizing, being critical? How about finding fault? Fault finders. Is that a fruit of the Spirit? Should we just be displaying that? I, says, I said this, and this is my translation. What fruit you display determines who you are. I didn't find that in the Bible. So I come up with it on my own. That's my translation. What fruit you display determines who you are. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I was trying to remember. I had somewhere to go with that. I didn't write it down. It was about, um, is it on the next page? Let's just keep going. It'll come back, it'll come back in another place. But, but, but a lot of people want to dis display or confess to be God, but yet they're displaying what the world is and thinking they're born-again Christian. So what is the world? Do you look like the world? Do you act like the world? Do you experience the same joy that the world experiences? Do you look at sin and relish it? Do you love rebellion and relish it? If you do, you don't know God. 
It says you would know them by their fruits. And um, hallelujah. Why is a, why does sinners sin? Why do sinners sin? Because they're sinner. You can't be habitual. I don't know why I'm going on this. This wasn't even in my notes. You can't be a habitual person that practices sin, lives in sin, and then we have people in, not this church, but in churches that live a lifestyle of sin, but yet they, what they've done is when they first started, they was probably, they felt guilty, they felt convicted, but I can tell you something, that's why you gotta be careful when you entertain sin, because it won't be long, you'll be comfortable in that sin. So my, one of my guess moral of the story or more of the teaching night is don't get comfortable in your sin because if you do you know not God you know not God you know about God well matter of fact just say God doesn't know you because we cannot live a lifestyle of sin every day doing the same thing just living a lifestyle of sin and then expecting that you're this righteous person, and you're on the way to heaven. Amen. God died for us. God died for our sin for us not to live in it anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we, now, I've already talked about we all mess up and we all sin. David, was a, he was a great example. He, he sinned bad. But he repented. D David was considered, you don't even have to argue to believe it, he was the holiest man at the time. There was nobody holier than David. But what David did, and this is a nugget I want you to get tonight. David put something in front of him that he really didn't want in him. So what I'm saying to you, don't put, some, don't put anything in front of you that you don't want in you. If David had never seen Bathsheba, he wouldn't have went after her. He wouldn't have went after her. And that's what, he, it, that, that lust made the holiest man at the time bow to sin. The holiest man, David. Are y'all with me? So don't put nothing in front of you that you don't want in you. And that could be a whole lot of variety of things. But mostly what I'm talking about is sin and sin is a lot amen? amen i don't know why or how i got off on all that five ways to run the race with christ number one run the race with passion hallelujah, hallelujah. be passionate about being a christian titus 2 14 i'm gonna just kind of speed this up it says who gave himself for us that we, or that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people. That's us. We're special people. Zealous for good works. The past translation says he sacrificed himself for us. Jesus sacrificed himself for us that he might purchase our freedom from every lawless or sinless, sinless deed and to purify himself a people, which is us, who are his very own, passionate to do what is beautiful in his eyes or passionate to do God's will. Hallelujah. God wants passionate Christians. Mark 12, 30 says, to love the Lord your God, you know the scripture by heart, with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. Do you realize how much or do you understand what kind of love that is? To know God is to love God, Amen. truly love God. Number two, lay aside every weight and run with endurance. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, which is the, the, the people of faith that have gone on with Christ, let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us. This was written kind of out of an athletic mindset. 
you know, athletes wear when they do, you've seen them when they do track and field and things and they're trying to run faster, they're trying to, to win the race, they want to be as weightless as possible. In other words, they don't want anything hindering them from running as fast as they can run. Same way with Christians. It says don't let nothing lay aside every weight. That means every hindrance. Lay aside every hindrance and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Hebrews 12, 11. We all know that sin can hold us back. But there are all thing, also things that may not be sinned, which is every weight, but merely hindrances that can keep us from running the race that God wants us to run. So it's not necessarily sin that's a hindrance. It could be any, it could be other stuff that's a hindrance. You need to make some adjustments. Amen? The Holy Spirit can show you what adjustments you need to make if you keep yourself in the right position to hear from God, to trust God. You've got to be in the right position. Amen? Hallelujah. We've all been taught to always do the right thing, which is certainly true, but sometimes our choices are not always between right and wrong but between something that may hinder us and something that may not hinder us. Is there anything in our lives or in your lives that you should lay aside? Make some adjustments. The sin that so easily ensnares us means the word easily ensnares is translated from a difficult ancient Greek word, and I don't, I'll try to say it, euperistaton. E-U-P-E-R-I-S-T-A-T-O-N. Ensnares us is a Greek word comes from Europeristaten, which can be translated four ways. That word can be translated four ways, which is easily avoided, admired. This is talking about sin that easily ensnares us. Ensnares us. Easily avoided, admired, ensnaring, or dangerous. The word says to lay all of them aside. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. God does not want us bogged down with the cares of this world. In the parentheses I have get rid of stuff. Sometimes it's just stuff. And sometimes it can be people. Sometimes it even can be family members. Sometimes you got to you got to get rid of stuff that's distracting you necessarily wrong it's not even not necessarily bad for you if you just look at that but there are things that can distract you there are people that can get on your nerves you know sometimes you got to cut them loose i've had to cut some family members loose because of their vulgarity early on you know this has been years and years ago but in order for you to stay in the right position with god you got to make the right adjustments for yourself Hallelujah. Amen. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, glory. glory. I said, glory. glory. Let me run this thing down here. But run the race with endurance. Endurance is a steady determination to keep going despite temptations, tests, or trials, and despite circumstances. You've heard Dad say many times, they're all going to be tests and trials. You're all going to go through a valley, but don't go in there and camp out. <laughs> Don't pull your tent out and build a campfire. Even though that sounds good, don't it? Build a little campfire, cook something on the stove. <laughs> don't do that. You keep running the race. You keep going through your tests and trials. You're going to come out on the side stronger than you were when you went in it. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. We serve a faithful God, folks. And let us consider one another, and oh, this is good, in order to stir up love and good works. Faith, listen to this, faith and hope can be expressed or it can be practiced by yourself. It can be practiced by yourself. It can be practiced alone. You can practice faith alone. And good, but love is only made possible with people. Are you with me? It takes another party. It takes another person. It takes other people to express love. In verse 25, right after that, it says, the very next verse says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. One commentary says this, forsaking fellowship, 
with people, with other Christians, is a sure way to give place, give place to discouragement. And I'll even add depression in there. Didn't like, that didn't go over good. So I'm just telling you what the, the I think it was the Matthew Henry commentary. It says it, it gives place to discouragement. This discouragement can fester where God's people are not fellowship and exhorting one another. You can give place to discouragement. If, you know, if I've got, a, I've got a remedy for depression and discouragement, get into a good word church and get involved in the church. We have, in this church, have something for every age group. Not, I'm not talking about Wednesdays and Sundays. I'm talking about there is, a, there is a ministry that has every age group. Children's ministry, youth ministry, crossroads is our older teens right after high school, college. We have a young adults. We have Terry's and young adults. We have, um, we have a young at heart, the older group. We have successful singles group. We have a group for every, we have a class for every age group to get involved. Amen? So we keep you from being discouraged. Keep you from getting depressed. Hallelujah. So I encourage you all to get involved. This is a lot of fun when you hang out for good people. Amen? Hallelujah. We are living in a world that is constantly changing, and living in this era, we certainly must make sure that we stay rooted, grounded, confirmed, and established in the Word of God. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to skip down. Verse uh, number, number four was look ahead unto Jesus. Look at the prize. Number five is to live by faith. Last one, to live by faith. Hebrews 10, 37 through 39 says, Yet for a little while, and he who is coming will come, will not tarry. But 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. I said the just shall live by faith. It is faith that is pleasing to the Father. Hallelujah. I said it's faith that's pleasing to our Lord and Savior. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I said thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I finally got to the end of it. Praise God. Just want to encourage you to know who Christ is. Always get stronger every day, every week. Keep coming to church and um, be a light to the world. This world needs light. So continue to be a light in the world. Amen. Amen.